Welcome, everybody, to a special edition of the It My Cash podcast. Uh, I am your host for this episode. My name is Brian Young. I am the Turtle Dork. I am joined with Brad Gullix and Mouth Dork. Welcome. Hello. Welcome to into your own Dork Cave. Welcome into my own Dork Cave. I like it. I love the decorator. It's nice. It's yeah, really nice. He's got a lot of good taste. He does. He really does. So um, we're doing our top films of the decade. Now, I presented this to Brad a few months ago, and I was like, dude, you know, realize that this is the end of 2019. And we should do a top 10 of the decade. Like, you know, we started our pop, which, you know, I, I want to get into some of the big events of this past, uh, especially oh, within, man. within uh, I guess, uh, film Twitter or the, or the film okay, world. Okay. I thought you were going um, like, within our lives. No, 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 no. No, but just within, like, just a lot that's happened this last decade. We started this podcast, 2014. So um, I thought it was fitting. Like, yeah, let's look back at this decade and just talk about some of the films or some of our favorite. These aren't the best the best in our opinion but these are the best but our favorite movies of the decade um but let's be real like every best of yeah. list is actually a favorite list I exactly Art regardless is subjective yeah regardless of what dave ehrlich or anybody else may <laughs> say it's subjective yes it is completely yes. subjective but this has been a crazy decade man so there's been a lot of things that, is, that have happened in this past decade. So within the film world, um, things like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, comic book movies that started in 2008, but we really saw the boom of comic book movies happen in this last decade. Of course, things that happened with the Me Too Time's Up movement, the fandom of Twitter, when the negative fandom when it comes to stuff like Star Wars or Batman well, v Superman. Twitter changed everything. Yeah, yeah. So, like, what stands out as far as like within the film world this past decade that you think we're going to look back on this decade? Well, I think I think Twitter is essential to the conversation. Yeah. You know, obviously, we all follow our favorite critics. And our critics often get access to films before general audiences. True. And I have had to adjust my online behavior okay. so that I don't get swayed by early reactions. You know, like, let's take 2019 and Joker, right? Yeah, All right, perfect so example. Joker does, goes to the Venice Film Festival, wins the Golden Bear, and... You know, it's like, oh my God, this is going to be the next big thing. Yeah. But, and and then that's like months before we get to see it, right? And in the course of those months before we even get to watch the film, yeah. the narrative has gone peaks and valleys, peaks and valleys. Yes. By the time you get to watch it, you feel like you've seen, you've the, seen film the movie already. already. Exactly. Yeah. And so I feel like I've had to ease back on okay. early reactions, unless I'm giving up, you know? <laughs> Lisa and I, we're about to go to the Sundance Film Festival, and uh, then I'm going to bombard all of you jerks don't spoil it, with all my spoiler emotions. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. So I, I think Twitter uh, and, and, and film Twitter is yeah. like this massive thing yeah, that yeah. is both great and terrible. Because you, you think at the beginning of the decade, Twitter wasn't what no. it is now. No. At 2010, Facebook was kind of, I mean, of course, we got the social network, which, surprise, it's not in my top 10. Um, but that movie came out in 2010 at the beginning of this decade and the boom of Facebook. But now we see by the end of this decade, Twitter has really kind of surpassed that. Oh, for where sure. Where it's become that thing that people have come to. And, and I mean, it is the online platform that I like the most. Okay. But, it took me a long time to learn how to operate it and use the mute yeah. function and the block function. <laughs> yes. You have to strategize with Twitter. Yes, especially when it came to Endgame or Infinity War. Oh, oh. Or Inf when Endgame was coming up, uh, I think I had 155 oh words God. muted. <laughs> wow. Like every variation of Captain America, you know, Cap, Steve, Steve Rogers. Like Just stay off Twitter, man. Oh, I can't. I can't it. do I it. Can't it. do it. Oh, what about you? Besides, besides social media. Uh, social. You know what stands out? I mean, I know the Me Too movement was huge, and I think that's um, hopefully something that is going to change the landscape of film. But it, a lot of it, I think, it's really. I, I look at like the comic book boom that happened. Of course, uh, MCU started in '08, but seeing what we got with the DC universe and how Marvel has really created this infinity saga and it just i think when we look back at the tens um 
that's going to be uh, something yeah. that we really are going to say, like, look, this is where comic book movies, wherever it goes from here, that we're going to say, like, this is when this genre was really well, like, thriving. Well, look at our lifetime, right? Yeah. Let's not just look at this decade. Let's go back the past 40-plus years, yeah. right? Superman the movie, right, comes out. Yeah. And it's a big thing. And, yeah. you know, there are a couple, like, imitators of Superman the movie. Uh, but comic book movies, you know, for, for the majority of our lives yeah. have struggled and most of them when they came out were fine to terrible yeah and yeah. it was really in the last 20 years with okay. the launch of x-men and spider-man Spider mm -hmm. and of course blade let's let's get oh, yeah. love the blade oh yeah absolutely uh that 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 fandom like comic book fandom started yeah. to have a, a large space in film okay right and then marvel comes in yeah iron man yeah Incredible Hulk, and you look at those early movies, you look at Iron Man, it comes out the same year as The Dark Knight, Yeah. and they both feel like the same kind of comic book movie, where they're trying to take it very... Okay, uh, yes. Not, not, like, not like serious, but they're, they're applying real world um, ideas to comic book ideas, right? Absolutely, you're right. Um, trying to elevate superheroes into something more tangible. Yeah. But then with Marvel uh -huh. and Iron Man 2, less successful in 2010. That's the first movie of the, of the decade. Yeah. Uh, but then you get Thor. You get Captain America. And then once the Avengers hit and Joss Whedon really goes, Let, let's not do the Dark Knight thing. Let's not really do Jon Favreau's Iron Man. Let's do comic book movies. Let's show people really the joys of comic books. Absolutely. And that has changed everything. And for a guy like me yeah. and a guy like... Uh, all the dorks. Absolutely. Um, we love that stuff, and yeah. we've adored the MCU. Yeah. I know that some people don't adore the MCU, and that's fine. Yeah. It's a matter of taste. Yeah. But you're wrong. The MCU is great. <laughs> it is great. It is great. And I mean, I, I get if you come from a certain uh, era or um, a different type of. Uh, upbringing of the type of movies that you watch that maybe, you know, there's a little pushback to comic book movies. I mean, if but... you don't engage emotionally with the characters of the yeah, MCU, yeah. I get it. Martin Scorsese, yeah. I'm not going to get mad at you. It's no, fine. No. But I do engage with the MCU and you're going to see maybe one or two movies oh. come up in this conversation. Do I have... Well, I, I will give this little spoiler that I don't have any comic book movies. Oh. Well, no, any MCU movies. Oh, oh. And my top ten, but we'll talk about some honorable mentions at the end of the episode. Oh, okay. right. But that's a good segue. So going into creating this list of the best movies, the fa our favorite movies of the decade, um, there's a lot that goes into this because you know when we do our dorkies at the end of the year, it's easy because you're kind of looking at a 12 month period, right? Well, it's easier. That's for easier. Sure. But it's different where it's not as simple as just taking your favorite, your, your, your number one movie of every year and saying, okay, these are my right. top ten. Because movies change throughout the course of time. Your opinions about movies change. Um, maybe you revisit a movie and you see it differently. Some may fall as you think about them. So, like, it's, it comes a little bit more challenging, but still exciting to put these lists together. What was your approach? Uh, well, my approach was to start with the top tens, right? To yeah, look yeah. at the last decade. Of, of top 10 lists that I've constructed and you know coming to the realization that a lot of my number ones would not be my number ones now and then in some cases my number eights and my number nines would be my number ones yeah uh we're gonna get to my number five on my top 10 of the decade so curious and it really <laughs> stunned me that it that it's my number five that it got into this film okay. but uh that's how it goes. You, your relationships with movies change. You change as a person, as an audience member. Yeah. And that's what's exciting about the art form, right? Yeah. Uh, I will say that I had an easier time putting my top ten films of the decade than I do putting my best of the year list together, only because okay. it's not a matter of cramming, right? When we're in December, yes. we're like, i got to catch everything that I didn't catch in the year, and you're watching like yeah. 30, 40 three-star, two-star movies, mm -hmm. and going like, okay, well, they're not in my top ten. Whereas this, at least you have a base of, like, let's just look at the films that I adore. Okay, yeah. And find out, how, you know, which ones are the ones I adore, I adore the most. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that, that does make it a little easier. And I will say that, for the most part, my top ten 
was pretty easy to kind of put together. I kind of struggled with my number 10, which we'll get into. Um, my 10, 11, 12, I was, it was circling that last spot. But I think I'm just going to go ahead. And look, this list is arbitrary. All these movies, look, I made a 100 list. Um, so I'll put that, I'll put that up on, on, uh, on Letterboxd so everybody can kind of take a look at it. But these lists are kind of arbitrary. So we're talking about a decade worth of movies. And Grant, I don't see, as, I don't see every movie. And I don't see as many movies maybe had, like you or Disco you Dork see a seen. lot though, Brian. I, I've seen a lot, but... <laughs> Like I said, when you look at the list, just also take into effect that I haven't seen everything I mean, as well. And my my asterisk on my list is this is my list. Like we said, this go. is my favorite list. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to have as many art films as David Ehrlich might, right? Yeah. Like, I'm not going to have as much foreign cinema, okay? <laughs> I'm going to have more comic book movies. It's me. There you I'm go. I'm Brad. There you go. And that's what we want to see. We want to see how these lists reflect us as, yeah. and with yeah. our taste and who we are. So let's go ahead and get into All this. Right. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and start it off with my number 10. Please. Uh Kind of nervous. It's almost like once I say it, it's 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 solidified. Yeah, it's in stone. It's, it's in podcasting stone. I know. So my number ten is Scott Pilgrim versus the World. That is a damn good pick. Yeah, that is man. a damn good pick. It is not in my top ten. It's not. But maybe it should be. Oh it's man, it's such a good movie. We talk about this movie on the podcast before, and we also had a still awesome screening, which was a great screening. One for of our most popular ones. Yeah, absolutely. And I just love like the way Edgar Wright was able to take like the 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 the, the video game conventions and put that into like a film form, uh, like that whole boss level aspect of like the seven deadly, uh, the seven evil, uh, seven evil exes. I can't remember deadly exes, something like that. Either one, but I just love like he how he has to go through to earn the love of Ramona, and even at the heart of just the the video game aspects of the film. Um, it also has it, it's a it's a great story with uh, with Scott Pilgrim's character and Ramona's character as well, and I just really kind of responded to what Edgar Wright was doing with that film. I just I don't know, and it's one of my most rewatchable films. Yeah, we talked about comfort movies like on a podcast one time. It may have been a fistful, and those movies that we always like to revisit. And Scott Pilgrim has like become like that comfort movie for me. It's that it's that movie I can just pop on at any time and just have on. It's not my favorite Edgar Wright movie, but okay. it's probably his best. Okay. Uh, you know, we're saying we're not we're, all art is subjective, yeah. but like the craft yeah. involved with Scott Pilgrim versus the World is unreal. Uh, yeah. and, and, and so, you know, you see that craft, uh, uh, you know, elevated even in Baby Driver uh, in yes. a different genre. Yeah. But, but I, I'm, I do not know how I would make Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. How do you achieve that movie? Okay. Uh, I do not have the skill set to do it. Have you uh, read the, uh, the graphic novel? Yeah, the Brian Lee O'Malley books? Yeah. I have. Okay. Uh, I don't love them. Okay. Uh, All right. <laughs> I've, uh, I've read... My favorite Brian Lee O'Malley book is Seconds. I'm a big fan of that. Okay. I would highly recommend that book. Uh, but for whatever reason, I cannot engage with Scott Pilgrim. And... That reason might actually be the film because I saw the film first. And once you oh, see the film, it's okay. hard to backtrack into the sequential form. Yeah. Um, but it is a extremely faithful adaptation of okay. the book, which right. also might be why I don't love it as much because mm. I've experienced it first as a movie. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, but like... That makes sense. Scott Pilgrim, you know, performances are great. Yeah. Story's great. Uh... You know, uh, the energy is amazing. It the is. editing is unreal. I love the editing, the sound effects, the music, the score. Like I have that score on my on my uh, in, in my Apple Music on my phone, and I, I'll listen to it periodically. And I absolutely love the score and the soundtrack. The music in that movie is phenomenal. I love yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely yeah, love yeah. it. And everybody in that film has gone on to become uh, a captain in the Marvel universe. <laughs> Uh, America and yeah. Marvel, they're there. Yeah. You know? yeah, okay. That's right. Oh, yeah, Brie and... <laughs> and uh, uh, Mary Elizabeth Winston, she's the Huntress in Birds of Prey. Yeah. Comic book movies. And Michael Sarah is... Is Michael? He's in This Is the End, playing Michael Sarah. There you go. And he's great in that. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you have at uh, number 10? Uh, my number 10 is not a comic book movie, because I'm not basic, okay? <laughs> uh, my number 10 is my top film from 2019. Oh. Uh, it might 
in years going forward, scooch up the list okay. of my favorite films of the decade. But it's Bong Joon-ho's Parasite. Wow, number 10, okay. I just, like, the more I think about this yeah. movie, the more excited I get. It just dropped on digital. I'm yeah. like, really forcing myself not to purchase the digital because I want a physical copy physical of it, idea, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but, like, it, I love Bong Joon-ho films. You know, The Host is great. Snowpiercer is great. Yeah. Um, Okja is great. But Parasite, I feel like, it, it is absolutely his masterpiece. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's speaking to uh, the the now and our struggles with class and capitalism. Yeah. And how money is the root of all evil. And what's so brilliant about the movie is how you can't really come away condemning any character you can't. involved. You can't. Uh, even though my leanings might be more with the Kim family than the Park family, right? But yeah. it, 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 the villain, the monster of Parasite, and it is a, a monster movie. There, it, it is the Parasite. It is not the Parasite. It's the system. The system, right? That's, that's the villain. Um, yeah. And I, I just think I think it's it, like it, there's a lot to chew there. Performance again, great performances. It looks stunning. There are film. moments in this movie where you're just like, oh, I hope they capture that frame and turn that into a Mondo poster. Oh, my I God. I want that staircase scene illustrated. And just the architect, and not just the architect of, like, the house, but just the architect of the film. Like oh, where, the layers. Where the par- yeah, the layers. Where the parks, where they live compared to where the Kims live. And, like, how, like, and, and, and how that is visually portrayed in the film. Just... Everything about that movie is brilliant. It's so funny you mention that, and I'm not going to give anything away. No it's still fairly new. But I found myself, actually yesterday, um, yesterday at the time we're recording this, I found myself thinking about the end of that movie. Um, uh, just the, the end and like where, like with the, the sun. Final. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. the sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just that the whole idea of like, you know, you have these like lofty dreams, but... They're, are they they're impossible just, dreams? They're, they're yeah. just, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're just yeah. dreams. And it's, um, because of where you were born and who you were born from and stuff like that. It's, it's powerful, man. It's good. It's a great, <laughs> great, great little movie. Uh, and, and it is one of those movies, again, where you hear the buzz coming out of the Toronto International Film Festival. And yeah. everyone's like, don't spoil the ending, don't spoil the turn. Da, da, da. And you're like, yeah, yeah, but is there really going to be that big of a turn? Is yeah. that going to be that effective? And then as you watch that film, you're like, oh, damn. <laughs> this is not what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. And, you know, when an, when something is revealed, when you go to another location, mm-hmm. whoa. I know, I know. You're right. It's a, it's a phenomenal movie. So let's see what's going to happen during the Oscars this year. I mean, it's my best picture. Yeah? Yeah, it's yeah. not going to. We'll it's going to get best international uh, film. International film. <laughs> <laughs> so um moving to our number nine so my number nine i have from 2011 um attack the block oh that's a very interesting pick brian it's another oh, oh, oh. Did, will, it, will it come up again I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so i'll just give you a little bit about what i think of this movie again another still also we're killing it with we're, still awesome. we're so good at selecting movies we are we really are <laughs> um attack the block man i love this movie it goes back to something that you said back when this movie came out in 2011, and I still hold true to this with the character of Moses. I think he has probably one of the best arcs that I've seen um, in cinema this past decade. Um, it's it's so, I don't know, it's just something I was able to really kind of connect to, just seeing his arc as far as like how people saw him, who he thought he was. Like It plays this whole thing about hero, or being the hero, and he actually steps into that role by the end of this movie. And I don't know, there was just something beautiful about seeing that arc. And ultimately, when you have characters like this in film or in storytelling, that's what you want to see. You want to see a character transition. You want to see them have these type of arcs. And I just thought it was a great arc. And I love all and all of these characters in the movie, like all those kids. I thought all of them worked well together. It's so cool how they're introduced robbing yeah. uh, that lady, yeah. uh, Doctor Who. I'm, I'm blanking on her name. Yeah, Jodie Whittaker. Yeah, Jodie Whittaker, thank you. Yeah. Uh, because it is a scary scene. Mm-hmm. You know, they are, they are using their 
Uh, yeah. Um, um, what's the what's the what are they using? They're u- they're using their. Well, they're using her fear and, yeah. and her probably racism yeah. against her yeah. to rob her of her cash Ex- yeah. because they deem her as an outsider, right? Mm-hmm. And when you watch that scene, you're like, oh, these are bad. These are some bad kids. I don't like these kids. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but then the way the film introduces who they are and you you know, you know see their relationships mm-hmm. and the 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 pain that they are all suffering yeah uh, and Jodie Whittaker then gets to reevaluate her point of view of these kids and yeah. you get to reevaluate your point of view and yeah. challenge your own um, preconceived notions yeah. about these characters uh, it, that's really cool and I would just also say that John Boyega as Moses is phenomenal yeah and you know I'm so happy that he's done the Star Wars movies yeah. and he's solid in the Star Wars movies. Uh, but I'm excited now that he's away from Wait, those. Me too. To see what the fame of Star Wars will bring him back to maybe doing some more character stuff that he was able to do early and, and in his bring career. Bring more eyes to that kind of work. That, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I agree. hope people who love Star Wars go back and watch Attack the Block. I hope so too, man, because that's a phenomenal movie. I absolutely love that movie. And I love the world building. It's such a small film. But um, it, it does great world building uh, in that as well. So uh, it seems like you might have that on your list. So I'll go ahead and stop the conversation and we'll pick <laughs> it up uh, with some of your, some more of your thoughts on that, possibly. Um, but what's your number nine? My number nine is from 2014. It's my Paul Thomas Anderson movie on the list. It's okay. Inherent Vice. Starring I still haven't seen this. I would be curious to see what you would think about the film. I've heard mixed things about this film. Yes, and I've been in multiple audiences that have had mixed reactions okay. to it. Okay. Uh, and, and honestly, like the first time I watched it, I enjoyed it. And then I but I, I wasn't sure. Yeah. I knew I had to bring Lisa, so the very next day I brought Lisa back to the Angelica to watch it. She did not like it. That's this what film I remember. I remember her and, and Matt Constantine didn't like yeah, it. Did not like it. Did yeah. not like it. Darren and I were big fans. Yeah. And then we went to Lost Weekend 3 at the Alamo Draft House in Winchester, Virginia. Yeah. And watched it with a full crowd of people who did not engage with it. But again, oh. watching it for that third time on the big screen, I just felt deeper and deeper in love. And you know, it's a meandering movie. It, okay. It, it, it's a film that's set up with a mystery. Where the answer to that mystery is not as important as the journey that the character goes on. Interesting. Okay. Uh, and I think it's Joaquin Phoenix's best performance and most, you know, nuanced performance. Okay. Uh, I love him as an actor. Uh, of course, I liked him in Joker, and I liked him in You Were Never Really Here. He's had a great he's decade. Like, yeah, he's had a great decade. The Master. Uh, uh, but yeah. this is the, oh, the Master, and you know, like. The Master and Phantom Thread and and those are the movies that you are seeing get talked about on the top ten lists. But for me, it's the wild, psychedelic, <laughs> uncomfortable yeah. journey of Inherent Vice. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a doped out noir. Okay. And I dig it. It, it. When you were describing that, it reminds me of that movie that I know you didn't respond to That's under the, the Silver, Silver Lake, Lake, which is like Inherent Vice light. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll check it out. I think it's on some streaming services. I'm sure. I'm sure. It's long, right? And, yeah. and I think a lot of modern audiences, although maybe the Avengers Ed game is changing this, uh, maybe. Uh, it's kind of bulk at movies that push against that three hour mark. Yeah. And so if you're in a theater and you're going like, what's the point of all this nonsense? It's not like Inherent Vice in the last third is going to be like, aha, I told you. <laughs> this is why you liked it. And yeah. What you get in the beginning is mostly what you get by the end. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. I'll, I'll look for that. I'll look for that. Um, I, I've been I've been staying away from it because I just don't know. Because I've mean, heard mixed things. And I was like, eh. I don't think it's a Brian movie. Okay. But I, I, I would still like to get your take on okay, it. Okay. I'll pull the trigger on it. I'll pull the trigger on it. So this is interesting. Um, my number eight is was a still awesome screening, and. <laughs> Re- looking back at the decade and reevaluating, I talked about this a lot as far as like how movies, your opinion about movies change, and I still think it's one of my favorite movies, but it's no longer my favorite movie of the year, uh, of all time. It's The Gray. Oh, eight. 
It's number eight. Cause I, looking, I thought this was gonna be like your one. Yeah, but looking at looking at the other movies on my list and how I personally respond to these movies, I was just like, wow, like okay, the greatest. Just, it just dropped a little. Yeah, it just dropped. So what, I still did, did that. Still, awesome screening have anything to do with? No, that? no. It's just the movies that came out um, post when I've when I've since I've seen that movie. Move some movies in two thousand eighteen, which was a strong year of the decade. And 2015, just a lot of movies that I found myself really responding to more than The Grey. Um, and I don't want to knock, I don't want to knock on that, but then it, it just made me think, like, huh, maybe it's not my favorite movie of all, all time. All right, but tell us why you love it anyway. I love The Grey, man. Um, it's, that, it's the journey of Liam Neeson. It's, the, it's that journey of him, of a faithless man coming to terms and finding his purpose through... Um, through life and death. I mean, this is a movie about about life and death, and it's about him, who a man who's it, it feels like he's. I don't want to say he's so eager to die, but it's almost like he's lost so much that he's, he's ready. In despair. Yeah, yeah, that he that he's ready if that time was to come. But once he's faced with that impending death, is when it's almost like he finds the courage to finally fight for what he feels is worth worth living for. And I don't know, I just found something beautiful about that movie. And the way Joe Carnahan directs that movie is extremely poetic. Um, I love the score. Um, damn, maybe it should have been... <laughs> it's a great movie. I love it as well. Um, yeah, these lists are arbitrary, so this could change. <laughs> Look, but it definitely was going to be in my top ten. But I, I do... I do respond to this movie in such a profound way and i just i think it's probably one of liam neeson's best uh performances because this came i think right after the death of his own wife in uh, natasha richardson um is around the time when this movie came out so it just it you can almost feel there was something authentic there um that i think that he was really connecting with um that i think the audience can can kind of connect with as well with this performance I don't know. It's just it's just such a beautiful movie to me. So, yeah. okay. my number is my, okay. my number eight. Damn. Damn. that's Ta my, the first big surprise of this episode. Ta talking about it, man. Now I feel oh shit. Okay. No. Anyway, it's in podcast stone. There's no going back. There's no right. going back. No, oh, no. fuck. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, what, so what's your number eight? Uh, my number eight is another 2014 film. Okay. Uh, it's my Wes Anderson movie of the decade. It's the Grand Budapest Hotel. Okay. Uh, it's just a confection. Yeah. I think that word gets thrown a lot with Wes Anderson, but I agree okay. with it. It is delicious. It I is delightful. It. I saw it once. You did? Yeah. yeah. I love how the film opens. It's this yeah. teenage girl. She's approaching the gravesite that's simply labeled author. She opens a book to read at the author's gravesite, and then we cut to the author preparing to recount his uh, first trip to the Grand Budapest Hotel, and then the film flashes into the author's experience at the Grand Budapest Hotel, mm. uh, and, and all the weird and strange characters that yeah. he encounters in this fictional history that is on the verge of its own World War II, uh, and okay. this um, uh, concierge played by uh, Ray Fiennes and his... Um, Bellboy, uh, Bellhop, Zero, oh, yeah. uh, played Tony, by Tony Rivoli. Yeah. Uh, and their relationship is just so like warm and sweet, but they're dealing with life and death stuff, and they're dealing with the heights of romance. Okay. You know, his character falling for Saoirse Ronan's uh, dessert maker. And I, like, I just, this is... This is a blanket movie. This is you're talking okay. about comfort foods. Yeah, like this is something that I just really like to wrap myself in. And I am a big proponent of Wes Anderson's Dollhouse filmmaking. I love it too. Uh, I love it too. And, and like, I I really enjoy when he embraces artificiality on every level of mm. design, performance, yeah. narrative. You know, this is not real world, but it is speaking to real emotions yeah um, yeah so i don't know like the grand budapest hotel, hotel is just uh, i i think is his crowning achievement yeah he has this storybook like yeah like kind of visual style that i always respond to that i love that's very distinct to him lisa and i went and saw bad boys for life at the animal draft yeah. house uh, the other night and part of the pre-show 
Uh, they had the Rushmore Max Fleischer players reproduction of Armageddon, where like all the Rushmore <laughs> teens are putting on yeah. their performance of Armageddon, their idea of Armageddon. Yeah. And Wes Anderson's stuff all feels like a high school play that he's put on with a budget. Yeah, and I you're right. That. I You're right. That. Absolutely. Wow. No, that's awesome, man. I, I'm a, I'm a, I want to rewatch that because I love Wes Anderson. He's had a couple of movies this decade. Moonrise Kingdom, I think. Yeah, Moonrise Kingdom, and of course, like Isle of Dogs. Yeah, and, and, and I, 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 I like all of them. Yeah. Uh, for the yeah. most part, yeah. But uh, Grand Budapest, that's the one. That's the one. That's the number eight. All right, moving to our number seven block. Now, after talking about the gray, maybe I would swip. No, uh, no, nope, nope. swap. Podcast Stone. Oh, damn it, Brad. Um, but I love this movie. It came out 2018. Um, it's a quiet place. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just completely responded to this movie in such a positive way. Um, I love the fact that you just kind of take a simple premise and it's just so effective, especially in the experience of watching it in the theater with a crowd, how it forces people to be quiet. It's like, Good job, Krasinski. Let's oh, do that more often. And it forces you to <laughs> listen. Yeah. So even in that theater, you're paying attention to everybody like clinking their ice around yeah. and <laughs> mashing of their popcorn. Absolutely. You're hyper aware. You have a way of everything. And then the storytelling in this in this uh, in this movie, I think there is literally only two scenes that has actual dialogue in it. Um, that's the scene he has with his son at the waterfall and then one that he has with uh, Emily Blunt after she's given birth when they're in the basement. But everything else is just done straight through just the emotion of the performances and the relationship that he has with uh, Millicent Simmons, um, who is deaf in real life, the relationship that he has with her and the culmination of that, and I'll give spoilers, this is about two years, about two years old, so I'll, spoiler warnings, but I'll give a, a spoiler alert for this, that um, when he sacrifices himself to tell his daughter that he's always loved her because she's always questioned because of maybe what happened um, to their son at, the, at the, uh, the cold opening of the movie, and you see that there's that friction between that relationship, but it, when you get that moment at the end where he sacrifices himself and he says, you know, I've always loved you, and he gives out that guttural yell, it's just, I mean, I get goosebumps thinking about it. Like, I was like, wow, to bring that type of relationship, that, that, that type of emotion to this movie, I don't know, I just found it so engaging, man. I absolutely love, love this movie. And it's, it's my second most anticipated movie of 2020, um, but I'm a little wary because I like that first movie and how contained this was and it feel, and I think it does do a lot of great world building, but to see where that could possibly go in the trailer and don't get me wrong, I'm still excited. And I think what I'm seeing in that trailer looks phenomenal, but, um, I'm cautious. Yeah. I, the Cillian Murphy character, uh, mm. I'm, I, I'm not responding well to it. It okay. feels very... George Romero dated like I'm not crazy about it yeah uh, depends on what they do with that relationship I think it is a world that I would be happy to return to yeah. and and but uh, the first film it, it it really did feel like I got all I needed from it yeah yeah I I, I agree I'm, I'm open to the idea and but we'll see. I'm, yep. I'm just going. I'm. I'm a whole. I'm a hold on reservations. But that's my number seven. I absolutely love a quiet place. So, Brad, what do you have at number seven? Uh, my number seven comes from 2017. It's the introduction of a filmmaker that I was <sighs> rocked by. Okay. Uh, I was not going. prepared for. Uh, it's Jordan Peele's Get Out. Yeah. Um, Key and Peele is next level brilliant. It's my it favorite is. sketch comedy ever yeah. because it's funny as hell and it hurts, right? Yes. Like it, every joke cuts. Mm -hmm. Every joke comes in and and and, and, and comments on how yeah. terrible you are as an audience member <laughs> and for not saving this world. Um, and, and he applies that same level of uh, viciousness uh, with his scares, yeah, he right. Does. Um, and, and Get Out is not a terror film. 
I think there are real spooky moments. There are jumps in the film. There are mm-hmm. uh, 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 moments of uncomfortable dread. There yeah. are moments of uncomfortable comedy. Uh, I, it is like a hodgepodge of tones. It is. And it, for me, really, really works. And it feels like uh, Jordan Peele from Get Out is one of our new great directors. Absolutely, easy. Uh, and I'm not being hyperbolic. Mm. And I know that Us was not received as well as Get Out was. Still made my top ten of the year. Yeah. I think Us is pretty damn brilliant. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And even weirder than Get Out. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is it better? No. Get but Out is something truly, truly special. It's special, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, so I don't know what else is there to say about this movie. I don't know, man. It may come up a little later. Oh, okay. All right. Well, then I'll just shut up. <laughs> no, we, no, we no, no. Talk about no. it again. But it is like a, it's a <laughs> great cast, and not only is Jordan Peele like a revelation, but Daniel Kaluuya is a yeah. revelation. And like, you know, like oh, well, I'm gonna follow him in everything. And oh, he's in Black Panther. That's great. Oh God, I wish. I wish he had a bigger part in Black Panther. And then you watch Queen and Slim, you're like, that's the role I wanted to see. Yeah. You know, like, I, I, and, and Widows. Oh, my God. Daniel Kaluuya and Widows. Man. So he's, like, one of my new favorites. Yeah. Jordan Peele's one of my new favorites. Um, yeah. Oh, and then, you know, Lil, Ra- Lil-, Lil Rel Howery is... Oh, yeah. phenom. Yeah. You know, so. Everything works. Everything works watch in Watch his movie. HBO special if you haven't. Okay, I'll yeah. check that out. I'll check that out. Oh, uh, yeah, everything works in that movie. Um, all right, so our number six. So my number six, man, I talked about this movie. This comes from 2015, which was another strong year. Um, oh, that's interesting. Man, this movie, okay, let me just say, Sicario. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. This movie rocked me. Yeah. This yeah. movie rocked me. I could, I could not believe what I was saying. And, I want to say this may have been my introduction to Denny uh, Villeneuve because I never, I didn't see Prisoners that came out a few years earlier. Have you seen Prisoners now? I have seen okay. Prisoners, and I, I really like Prisoners a lot. Um, but man, like what he did in this movie, showing like the uh, what's happening across the border in where is it Juarez? Yeah. Um, and then the story, the, the the intimate personal story that he's telling with Benicio del Toro's character, and then also like just telling the story about how the lines are blurred between like our governments and these drug cartels, and it's not the easy. The utility of it all. Yeah, yeah, and then like using like Emily Blunt as almost like our avatar through this world, like we're following this through her eyes and she's being brought into this world where it's it's challenging her own convictions and about And where this. it leaves her as a character is not a place you want to be left at normally no. as a, a you know a multiplex audience member. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I think a lot of people come out of Sicario going like, eh, because of the the crestfallen nature of its narrative. Yeah. Like, that's just so honest it, it feels is so real it, it really is man and the cast is just amazing and daniel kaluuya i think this may have been the first time i noticed him in a movie was him this in the, this movie. i think the first time i experienced him but i don't even think i bothered to learn his name after yeah. sicario it wasn't yeah. until get out yeah get out but uh uh josh brolin is so good but nisa was just next level but in this. it's it's villeneuve right yeah. like it's the direction it's the editing of that it's the score of that movie the score that charge into mexico to grab that guy, come out, and then yeah. the border shootout. You know, that might be my favorite action it scene. It is so decade. intense. It is so intense, man. I, yeah, you're right. Roger Deakins, his cinematography, uh, uh, Johan uh, Johansson, oh, yeah. his um, uh, Rest in Peace, his score, like all of that stuff. It just, man, that movie works, and man. Th- a lot of that score uh, it uses um, the Joker's composer's cello, uh, mm. Hilder... I can't pronounce yeah, her last, last name. name it's got a funny letter in it. I, I don't understand. Uh, Guadalajara, Guadalajara, New York. That's yeah. not it. <laughs> but, like, that like relationship that they had on that, yeah. and then they went on and did um, the Revenant score together. Okay, like, okay. It's some good stuff. Okay, so she worked under Johan. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, phenomenal, man. I love, man, that, that, the end of that movie. Woo-hoo. I almost... Now I'm almost well, Benicio. Benicio. Yeah. 
man, that that movie has stayed with me. So that's my number. Where we at number six? Um, what's your what's you what you got at number six? I just mentioned my number six is The Revenant. Uh, also oh. from 2015. Okay. Uh, and it, it, like to me, this is like when you watch the opening of The Revenant, it feels like this is Citizen Kane of filmmaking. Wow. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, Alejandro Inarritu, uh, that I felt like I was watching the best. Okay. Not my favorite. I felt like I was watching the best filmmaking going on in the world. Uh, like with the opening or the, the, just the, 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 the oh, I would say the entire film but the, okay. the opening was it punched me okay and I watched it on a screener link at home yeah. and I stopped it and I like I watched the opening scene and I was like nope I need to see this on IMAX I need to go to the AMC I need to see this on the biggest screen possible I need to see sit it in the front row and my life be the revenant okay uh, and I'm so glad I watched it that way yeah. on the biggest screen in our uh, area because it is, it is, it's it's a canvas. It's 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 yeah. a world. It, it, yeah. It's it's everything. Yeah. Um, and you know, Leonardo DiCaprio finally got his Oscar for it. Yeah. Good for him. He ate a bit bear liver or whatever to get it. <laughs> I think he is great in it, and I do engage emotionally with his quest for revenge against Tom Hardy, who killed his son. Like, it is very traditional mm -hmm. Western revenge storytelling. Yeah. There's nothing really in that narrative that you can't find in a dozen other films. Yeah. It's the craft. It's the direction. It's the editing. It's the cinematography. It's the score. It's the environment. Like, the majority of that film is shot in exteriors. Yeah. And that's insane. And not only just, like, you know, outside our apartment uh, yeah. in a parking lot... Like, in the worst conditions on Earth. Yeah. Uh, I remember the making of that movie. They talked about just how they had to match the lighting. Uh, we heard similar stories with, like, something like 1917. But yeah. And Iratu talked about that, how difficult the shoot was because of that. Yeah. And, you know, because of the uh, obsession with DiCaprio's got to get his Oscar yeah. in 2015. And because, you know, Iratu had just come off of Birdman, which is a solid movie. And mm -hmm. a lot of people love it. And a lot of people don't like it. And I'm kind of... I don't care about it. Like, I watched it. I go, like, oh, that's cool. Okay. Really interesting one-take movie. Yeah. I, I like the performances. But it didn't, yeah. like, sear into my soul. Yeah. The Revenant did. Um, and I wish people could approach it outside of the conversation of, look how hard it was to make this movie. Mm. Look at the blood, sweat, and tears that Leo sacrificed to make okay. this movie. Just sit in the front row of your local IMAX. <laughs> <laughs> and let it take over your life. Yeah. And so I, I, I love The Revenant. And I've watched The Revenant at home. And it's still very effective it on the, the television. Okay. you got to shut off all your lights. you got to put your phone away. Yeah. But, like, just it's, just a, it's a beautiful movie. It's a painful movie. It's an ugly movie. Uh, it's all those things. It's all those things you want. I'll never forget the experience of watching that in the theater. Now, I owned it on Blu-ray. And I've only seen it the one time in the theater. I haven't gone back to revisit it, but um, it was a sold out crowd, and every is you know how you can feel the energy in the in in, in an audience. Sure. Like I don't know if it was the energy, but you could feel that everybody was engaged into the movie. Like nobody could take their eyes off the screen. And Leo was in this movie. Damn it! I don't know if he's in every scene, but like he commands that movie. And I just, that was one thing I noticed. I remember in being in the theater, and I'm looking around, and everybody's fixated. Like, nobody could take their eyes off the screen. I just thought it was just a great experience watching that in the theater. So, yeah. You're yeah. right. You're absolutely right. Um, so, our number five is, man, right. halfway Here there. Go. Here All right. Go. So, I talk about this movie a lot. And I know they just had a screening at, at the Alamo Winchester. Um, it's a foreign film. My only foreign film in my top ten more cultured than I am. Uh, not, not really. <laughs> <laughs> it's Train to Busan. Oh, yeah. Love this movie. I saw this at Lost... I can't remember which Lost Weekend, um, but it was the opening night film of Lost Weekend 6 or 7, maybe. Sorry, Andy. Um, there's a lot of Lost Weekends. <laughs> there's a lot of Lost Weekends. You get lost. You do get lost. But, man, I, the moment I saw this movie, it was in my top 10 of the year, 
Um, I've kind of restructured a lot of my previous top tens and going back to 2016, it is my favorite movie of that year. Um, sorry, La La Land. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, yeah, um, but, um, no La La Land in this decade then. No, but oh. I might talk about it in my honorable mentions. Okay, okay. <laughs> All right, you're, but, you're, you're surprised at this guy. I know, I know, man. But, um, Train to Busan, man, I just responded to that main character and the relationship that he has with his daughter and where he goes by the end of this movie. And then all of the other ancillary characters that, that are in this train cart and how you really connect with all these different characters. And when certain characters die, you feel for them. It really does bring a lot of suspense and tension with the zombies. I think it's probably one of the best, if not the best zombie movie, in my opinion, of the of the decade. Um, I just... Everything about this movie worked. It brought me to tears by the end of the movie. What happened um, between the father and the daughter. No spoilers, but you can probably guess what happens. Um, <laughs> but yeah, man. like I just was completely enraptured by this film. I love Train to Busan. Absolutely love that it's movie. It's a great movie. Love that film, man. And that so is a film where... Uh, you fall in love with it the more you watch it. Yeah, and my introduction to Don Lee, who now is like I I watch anything that he's in. I saw that movie, uh, the the gangster, the cop, and the something. I can't remember. I apologize for not remember. I don't have it in front of me. But um, the movie was okay. But he was amazing in that. And of course, Eternals. Can't wait. Come on, man. Uh, so, yeah, number five, man, halfway there. What you get? Oh, this is the one! Yeah, yeah. It, and it's a comic book movie. Uh, it's a comic book movie. Oh, shit. Um, and it's a movie that I recently watched on the big screen in 3D uh, for the first time since I had seen it okay. uh, in 2012. Okay. It's Dread. Okay, all right. I thought you were going Hellboy, but... Uh, no, 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 no. Hellboy 2019, spoilers, is not going to be on my top ten. Uh, no, no, it's Dread. Okay. Um, starring Carl Urban, who personifies the comic book character of Judge Dread. Okay. Uh, in a way that I just didn't think was possible on screen, especially after experiencing the horrendous awfulness of Stallone's Judge Dredd from the 90s. Yeah, man. A film that I kind of like. Okay. Uh, it's okay, Brad. It's, <laughs> it's okay. okay. It's okay. <laughs> but, you know, this movie, directed by Peter Travis, but for all intents and purposes, word has it, Alex Garland oh, yeah. directed this movie. Yeah. And it feels like an Alex Garland movie. Yeah, because he wrote the script. He wrote the script, yeah. 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 Um, this was like his stepping stone into Ex Machina and Annihilation. Yeah. Uh, but I think this movie is better than all of his other oh, movies. Oh, you uh, high on Ex Machina. Well, you know, like, the, the other thing is, is, like, when Dread came out, uh, I'd seen The Raid, right? And The Raid and Dread, narratively, are very similar. Yeah. There's bad dudes up in this building. Let's go get those bad dudes. Yeah. And let's do it in the most violent way possible. Yeah. Why I like Dread more than The Raid, which is a hard thing to say. I know. I, I, can, I can see you struggling say. with that. The, the reason I like Dread more than The Raid is because of its trappings, is because of the character of Judge Dread, okay. is because of the world of Mega City One, mm -hmm. is because of the villainy of Mama. Um, it was great. And, you know, Dread is a character who is despicable. He is a horrendous creature. Okay. Uh, you know, he is a judge, jury, and executioner. And he will, you know, he, he will not bat an eye if you die because your crime was vagrancy. And mm. a door falls atop you. He told you to get out of here, and you didn't get out of here. So when that door drops on you, yeah. and you become a puddle of chunky flesh, <laughs> that's your fault. <laughs> um, and, and I, 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 I just adore his character, which is a character we should all be as scared of, and is a character that represents a lot of all the awfulness in our systems of government and law and all that yeah, today. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. When you get to the end of Dread, and they have, spoilers, survived, uh, <laughs> uh, survived this encounter with this gang of uh, drug dealers. Yeah. And... It, Dredd's commissioner comes up to him and goes, oh, it sounds like it was pretty scary in there. And Dredd goes, just a drug bust. And you realize that the movie Dredd is just Tuesday. <laughs> 
That is hilarious and awful. Yeah, kind of awesome too. Awesome. <laughs> it's so awesome. I, I don't know. Like he's he's a character. You watch Dread and you go like, well, I want to see Wednesday. And I want to see Thursday. Where is my franchise? There we, I need it. Or a series or something. something. They, they flirted with the idea of that. It's just that, like, Carl Urban is one of the most underrated actors. Yeah. If you look at his work, you look at Dread, you look at Bones from the Star Trek films, mm. you look at The Boys, you look at Red, right? Yeah. A movie that no one thinks about, but you should watch because Urban is great. He's, he is good. And he's not the lead. But... He is a Lord of the Rings. Of the he Rings, is a yeah. chameleon actor. He is, yeah. And he, he's performing with a frown. Yeah. That's that's he's got he's got no eyes. You know, he's just performing with his the lower half of his face, and he is so funny. He yeah. is so scary. He is so um, um, uh, forceful. Like he's just. He has it all. He's 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 so perfect. He has it all. Like it is. We're, we're going to talk about, well, I assume we're going to talk about other comic book movies, but oh, yeah. as far as, like, reaching into the panels and just picking that character out mm. and putting him in front of the screen, there's no better translation yeah. from the art and character of the book to the film. That makes a, that makes a lot of sense. And, and he loves all of this geeky stuff, man. Yeah. That's why and, you see him in and, all these different And things. so in 2012, Dread was not my number one. I think it was my number eight, okay. uh, but I have watched it more than... Uh, any other film of that yeah. year, and it's I think one of my 100 favorite films of all time as well. Oh, nice! Uh, so, yeah, that's a perfect example of what we just talked about as far as like how opinions of movies can change over time. Yeah. Uh, same with my number five with Train to Busan. It's just like you know, as t as you sit with it, the movie kind of grows in your estimation. And they made it very cheaply. And uh, yeah, you really can't tell. Yeah. Like, like you know, there's there's some stuff outside of the peach trees building. Mm -hmm. There's some you know landscape shots of Mega City One and some yeah. digital stuff, but like it's a run and gun movie. It is. It is. I love that. Uh, Li uh, Olivia Thurlby. Oh, that's she's her so name. Good. She's it great. Yeah. Anderson, Judge Anderson. Yeah, love her, man. Was introduced to her in Juno and um, the Wackness, and she was just she's just great. I yeah. wish she would do more. Um, okay, so going to number four, I won't talk about this long because you already brought it up. My number four is Get Out. Oh, yeah. Um, everything that you said about Get Out, man, like I said, I mean, of course, it's just something um, that I kind of responded to as a black man, be, like understanding that situation of, you know, uh, going somewhere and feeling like the only one there. And, you know, he sees like Lakeith Stanfield and feel like, oh, man, it's another brother there. Like, all right. And, Realize like, oh wait, something, something else is not right here. Like, I don't know, just the way like Jordan Peele was able to like just build, like he was saying, build that tension. I just thought it was just phenomenal. And rewatching this movie, there's so many other things that you can pick up. Like, there's so many, there's so like the devil's in the details. There's so many details that leads you to the end of that movie. Um, that I just like, man, it's just the brilliance of the writing and the filmmaking and how he slowly reveals, peels back the onion, so to speak. The idea of the sunken place, like all of these things, man, it's just for a debut film. Yeah. Well, like the, the term sunken place, that's like in our language yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's part of our vernacular yeah 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 it's crazy i absolutely love everything that he did with this and you're right like he's with one movie me and darren talked about this with one film he has become a brand of his own like he's part of like that the, the uh that echelon of directors like a nolan a tarantino that when you hear about their next movie, their name drives you to go yeah. see that film. And then you start a clock, a countdown clock of like, when is the release date? I need to see this. Yeah, and he did that with one movie. It's it, it's ridiculous, man. I can't wait to see his third film. I, I know, me too. I'm so curious to see what it's going to be. Yeah. Um, excited for his Candyman, too, that's coming out. Oh, this yeah. Because oh, yeah. he wrote, he didn't direct it, but he wrote and yeah, produced yeah. it. So and I'm like excited. Candyman, we talked about this on our most anticipated films of the decade okay. or, uh, episode. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, you weren't on that episode. Yeah, I missed it. Uh, but, um, you know, that is a film that there are a lot of great ideas in mm. the original Candyman, and there's a stellar performance from T Tony Todd in that movie. But 
it does some things that are extremely problematic. And you're like, this is not how Candyman should have ended. This is not how Candyman should have really even gone. Okay. And with Jordan Peele and Monkey Paw Productions giving another pass on it, I think, like, Candyman could be one of the great horror films. I'm so So, excited. So, fingers crossed. I'm so excited, man. Uh, What do you have at number four? My number four is another movie we've already talked about. It's Attack the Block. Okay. Oh, that's Uh, pretty high. Okay. You know, uh, what more can I say? Like... The monsters, we haven't talked about the monsters. Yeah, as far as, like, best creatures of the decade, those little black, inky blots of fur with yeah. neon glowing teeth. Uh, again, shot on the cheap, shot practically uh, uh, phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, that shot of Moses, samurai sword in hand, oh. hell-bent for leather down the hallway, yeah, the corridor, yeah. and all those creatures jumping Love. behind him, all in slow motion. Love it. Yeah, yeah, that's like, that's, you know, for a sci-fi geek, that's everything you need in life. That shot, and that's that's a poster shot, right before he opens the door, and it's the back shot of him, and um, I, f- I forget I forget the guy's name, but he's like, kill those things, kill oh, all yeah. of them. Kill, kill all them things. Yeah, and then when he says, allow it, yeah. and that backwards shot, and the music, oh my, that... Well, well, talk about allow it and trust, right? Yeah. Those have entered into dork cave yeah. uh, vernacular. We like that is like go to language for us. Oh man! Uh, and then just like again, I just want to highlight this idea that this badass mm-hmm. samurai wielding alien killing kid yeah. is a kid, right? Yeah. With Spider Man bed sheets. Yep. Like when Jody Whittaker goes into his room and see those sees those Spider Man bed sheets and that his his meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner have just been cold pizza. Yeah. That that scene takes that movie to top ten of the decade level. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. It's, it's more than just uh, a badass monster movie. Yeah, yeah. Man, man, we get into the nitty gritty right, now, man. Top number, three. Number three. I All have, right. well, I have some idea. Okay. I, I, I'm not, well, I'm not I, this, this sure. I, I think we I think this will cross over, but I, I won't talk about it much because I'm, I'm gonna leave you with some of the thunder for this oh, one. Let's see. I don't know. I Maybe don't know. I don't know. it is Spider Man into the Spider Verse. That's my number three. I thought you were gonna be like the Amazing Spider Man two. Jamie came, Fox is Electro. Came close, man. Came close. You know, <laughs> Electro, man. I, you know, I really felt his pain. Oh, you know. <laughs> anyway, but um. Into the Spider Verse. Um, what, what more can we talk about? 2018. This was on all the dorks' list. Whether it was one or two, I think everybody had it. Like maybe in their top. It was like my number three of the year, but I jumped it up to like my number two after the dorkies. Yeah, I mean, this year was. If you were a comic book guy in 2018, yeah. this year was it was too much because yeah. you yeah. had Avengers: Infinity War. Oh my god! Oh my god! Uh, you had Black Panther. <sighs> And I was like, well, I'm set on my yeah. favorite films of the year. Yeah. But then in December, drops into the Spider-Verse, which was a movie I was curious about. Yeah. But even on those trailers, I, I was like, I don't know about this thing. Yeah. It looks a little weird. Yeah. It, it's it's amazing, man. I talked about the animation. And I'm not even going to talk about the animation. I'm just going to talk about the story and the characters. It's the character of Miles Morales. You talk about it a lot. Like you say, like you say anyone can wear the mask. And this movie personifies that. Like, anybody can wear the mask. And I love the relationship that he has with Peter B. Parker. And just him coming into his own. Um, again, we, when I talk about Moses from Attack the Block, we talk about character arcs. Um another great character arc for a character like Miles Morales. Um, Him coming into his own as Spider-Man. That leap of faith. Like, everything that leads to that moment where he makes that leap of faith. And then that that, that montage that leads to him jumping off the building. Uh, Again, goosebumps, man. I just... It's just such a, a personal film, an intimate film... That it's about more than just superheroism. Superheroism. Yeah, that's superheroism. It. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, it's it's about um, a kid that has all these insecurities that's finding himself, that's coming into his own, and all the other characters have their own personal stories that they're dealing with as well. Like just Peter B. Parker with him, like uh, that moment at the end where he doesn't want to go back. He wants to sacrifice himself and. And like um, 
Miles Morales says, like, look, man, it's like, you got to go home. It's just like, and he's like, it's a leap of faith because of the relationship that he had with Mary Jane in his own universe and the struggles that he was having and how Miles in that moment was able, was a teachable moment for P, for Peter B. Parker. It's just so many different things. So I think as fans, we become so precious with our favorite characters, right? Yeah. Like, we love Spider-Man. Spider-Man's my favorite character. yeah. Peter Parker, God, I love Peter Parker. You know, don't mess with Peter Parker. Yeah. But what's brilliant about Spider-Man and the Spider-Verse is it reminds you that it's, while it is about the character that you love, it's also about the idea motivating that character. True. You know, True. and how with great power comes great responsibility yeah. is something that is not necessarily tied to Peter Parker. True. You can apply that yeah. to your life, and to other characters' lives. And what's so awesome about Into the Spider-Verse is that you get to see how all these variations of, uh, the, of Peter Parker's origin um, adapt and, and excel because they are trying to live up to this mm -hmm. idea of with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah, And I think that really makes Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse extremely special yeah. and highlights the brilliance of that old 1963 comic book written by okay. Stan Lee and illustrated by Steve Ditko. Okay. Um, and, and when you get to the end of it, to the Spider-Verse, and you know Ditko's name goes up and Stan Lee's name goes up and yeah. you get that quote from him. Yes. You know, like, you go like, yeah. It's not, it's not just about Peter Parker and Spider-Man and... It, 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 we we can all wear the masks, okay, yeah. you know. Like we can yeah. all step up. We can, we can, absolutely. Um, so yeah, that's my number three. Maybe it might come back up. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> what do you have? Number at, three. What do you, you have? Jerk. I know. I know. I know. I'm, t I'm a terrible human being. Uh, what do you have at number three? <laughs> uh, number three, another comic book movie. Uh, my only MCU movie on the list, uh, and I adore the MCU. Uh, it's Captain America the Winter Soldier. Yeah, yeah. 2014. Yeah. Uh, the first Captain America movie after the first Avengers. Uh, what I love about this storyline, and it's something that the comic book character has uh, had to deal with as, as well, is you have this person, this weak child, mm -hmm. who, uh, because he wants to contribute to the planet and to his country, agrees to scientific experimentation yeah. that turns him into uh, a demigod. And he fights for America in World War II. Uh, and he gives his entire being yeah. and his life. He sacrifices himself to it. He goes yeah. into the ocean. He comes out. He finds a country and a world that looks nothing, nothing. like yeah. he remembers. It doesn't operate. It doesn't hold the same values that he once held. Yeah. Uh, and it's not the America that he once lived in. Mm. Uh, but... It's all he knows. So when Nick Fury says, Cap, we could use you on in our team, in our military. Yeah, he's up for he's it. He's up for it. Yeah. And he, you know, he fights the space aliens. <laughs> and then in Winter Soldier, he's following orders, but now he's going, uh, why am I fighting this? Do I like what these orders are asking of me? Do yeah. I understand what these orders are asking of me? Yeah. Do I like where the direction of my country has gone since I left. Yeah, yeah. And maybe to be the best American that I can be yeah. is to go, this ain't right. Mm -hmm. And I know I have to stay true to my values and I'm going to have to challenge what you're doing. And that's, that is the ultimate Captain America story. Yeah. That's what Captain America should be about in 2019. In 2019, yeah. In right. 2020. 2020. Yeah, yeah, right now. Like, Captain America should be going, you know, um, why did this happen? Why are all these school shootings going on? <laughs> yeah. hey. why, why are cops shooting black black kids? Yeah. What's right. happening? What's, yep. So, like, that's what Captain America needs to do. I would love to see that. Uh, right. And that's what... I mean, if give me the script, yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna fight a Captain America that a lot of people are not gonna like, because the one that we need, but the one that we need, yeah, the one that we need, you yeah. know, because su superheroes are always going out and saving the day, 
But what do they do when they're saving the day? When like Superman's, you know, fighting uh, Lex Luthor and the Legion of Doom. Mm -hmm. What about all these people starving to death? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, I, I like it when a story like the Winter Soldier comes around and Captain America has the sh you know the shield yeah. lifted off of his it, vision. Yeah, they um, see clearly. And, and you know, like the Russo brothers bringing their love of 70s spy thrillers to the MCU and, and and delivering a film that really doesn't look or feel like any of the previous MCU entries. Does it? Uh, I, I, I appreciate that as well. Yeah. I think this is the film that truly elevates Scarlett Johansson's Natasha Romanoff to a, a, a fuller character. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, and a Falcon. I mean... There's no better scene in the MCU than the opening of Captain America: The Winter Soldier, where oh, Steve yeah. is, you know, running laps around the Falcon at the Smithsonian, yeah. and they connect as soldiers who um, are having difficulty uh, getting back into home life, back yeah. into the world, uh, and, and the connection that they form, the bond that they form in the first ten minutes of this movie, that's. That's why we love the MCU. Yeah. It's not because we're punching Thanos in the face. It's because we're watching Sam and Steve come together yeah. as 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 people, as, yeah. as fellow humans. Yeah, yeah. Put that list together. The things yeah. needs to catch up on. Yeah, and <laughs> then the way that pays off all the way into yeah. Avengers Endgame with oh. on your left, like when what you a, hear on your left at the end of Endgame, that brought if, me to tears. Yeah, man. if you're not crying, then. You yeah. don't like these movies? Yeah. Get the hell out of the theater. Why are yeah. you here? Why? Yeah. Get, get out. <laughs> Shut up. Stop complaining. Yeah. Use that seat for someone else who yeah. really wants to see yeah. it. Um, that's, that, you're right. You're absolutely right, man. The, MC, the MCU, man. MCU. All right. Let's get down to the nitty gritty. Number two. My number two. 2008. 2018 was a powerful, powerful year. Interesting. We talk about um, a lot of the angry cinema. I know Lisa's one of her favorite movies was Sorry to Bother You, oh, yeah. which was such an angry movie. Um, and my favorite movie of that year was Blind Spotting. Blind Spotting is just a movie that just just touched me deeply. Um, just that relationship between David Diggs and Raphael Casal. Um, the movie kind of presents itself as like a movie about gentrification and the Oakland area. But it talks about that, but it almost just kind of uses that in a way to really speak on culture, cultural identity and the struggle with cultural identity um, between, in this neighborhood um, between uh, Raphael, uh, Raphael Casal's character, who is white, but is seen as somebody that is kind of seen as a transplant because of the gentrification but who's grown up in that area and how he's having that difficulty of blending in um and how other people see him and then the v uh the v Diggs character who uh had to go to jail and is now in in a way kind of seen in a certain light because of the color of his skin in a way that his friend who's white is not seen in that way so I think it looks at it in a way that even in 2018 we had a movie like Black Panther that I think deals with cultural identity as well, more so on like a macro level, but this is more on an intimate level that I think really is, uh, is, is just a really powerful, powerful film. And again, going to like that anger, the ending of this movie... Um, when uh, a lot of the stuff is 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 uh, is done in freestyle and spoken word, and Raphael uh, uh, David Diggs is confronted with a cop, who he witnessed shoot down a young black man, and he's confronted with this cop, and he's able to just kind of spill out all of his emotions, all of his anger, all of his fears. He's able to just kind of let all of that stuff out, and you feel it in that finale. Um, to this movie so I don't know man this is just a movie that just it, it it just hit me in a way that just surprised me this year and it's just a movie that is still my favorite movie of that year um, and definitely yeah uh, almost my number one movie of the decade but it's my number two so. I need to rewatch it I, I only saw it the one time in the yeah, theater and yeah. I enjoyed it but I, I certainly wasn't as affected as you were yeah, yeah. Uh, but your 
uh, enthusiasm for it like encourages me to go back and revisit it. Yeah, man. Uh, I'd be curious to see what you think about it once you rewatch it. And I mean, of course, you probably won't have uh, the sure. feelings I have, but um, I, I'll always champion this movie and encourage people to just give this movie a go. But uh, that's my number two, man. So what do you have? I'm curious now. I, I, I think... I know one of your top, or oh, one of your two. Maybe I've already mentioned it, but I don't know. What do we got? My number two is Spider Man Into the Spider Verse. Okay, now I really don't know what your number <laughs> one is going to be. <laughs> uh, for a long time, it was my number one, yeah. but then I rewatched my number one recently. Okay. And I was like, no, this is my number one. Okay. Um, yeah, I like, what, what more can I say? I like, you didn't really talk about it, but mm -hmm. on top of it being a perfect. Spider-Man story yeah. by telling the story of Miles Morales by telling the story of Spider-Ham and Spider-Gwen and Spider-Noir and Peter B. Parker yeah. uh, that's all great like it's if it was live action and they shot the script as is it would be a great Spider-Man movie yeah right yeah. but the reason why it's a masterpiece is because it is an animated film true and it is not a traditional animated movie it doesn't look like any other cartoon that we've seen ever. No, you're right. And the way that it embraces all forms of art, right? Uh, all forms of, you know, comic book storytelling, uh, you know, from various eras mm -hmm. and from various artists yeah. and different cartoon storytellings and different frame rates. Uh, it, it, like, at times it feels like you're reading a, a, a stapled comic. Uh, yeah. and, and other times it looks like you're you're watching an old Hanna-Barbera cartoon. Like, yeah, yeah. It's, it's astonishing. It's an astonishing achievement that I can't believe any studio was on board for it. And I, I love the idea of there being another movie in this world, but... I also, you know, like we were saying with Quiet Place 2, like, can can you replicate this experience a second gonna, time? I was going to ask you about that. Like, what's your feelings about the sequel? I mean, I'll be there. Yeah. I'll be there. Uh, but I, I doubt it will be, uh, well, I know it won't be as powerful as the first time I watched this. You know, Darren and I went and saw it as an advanced screening at uh, Tyson's Corner. And, you know, like, the moment the... Uh, logo came up, mm -hmm. uh, the Columbia Pictures, you know, logo, and it flashed through all these different realities of that. You're like, oh, that's that's yeah. nifty. And then the comic book uh, code comes up. You're like, oh, that's these guys like comic books. And then you realize, like, oh, damn, they love comic books. <laughs> uh, like that, that makes Into the Spider Verse special in its own right. Like yeah. just, just just the amount of detail and passion uh -huh. for the four color form. Uh, that these filmmakers have it's awesome. is 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 incredible. And then on top of that, it's also the best Spider-Man story ever put together. Easily, <sighs> okay. easily, man. Yeah, yeah. Worthy to be one of the best of the decade. Yes. Um, All right. Yeah. Here we go. Number one. So I guess you you might you should know. I think I know. Okay. It is Creed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, I love Creed, man. Creed was a movie that just uh, it, it it's. It's everything that I love about movies. It's everything I love about cinema. It's everything that I love about um, storytelling, man. Like Ryan Coogler, this was my... I knew Ryan Coogler did Fruitvale Station, but I hadn't... At the time when I first saw Creed, I hadn't seen Fruitvale Station. So this was my introduction to Ryan Coogler. And once I saw this movie, the same way I felt about Jordan Peele, I was like, this is a voice. Like, you know... When you see, like, and we talk about authorship, like, we, we were talking about Michael Bay, I know I, maybe I talked about him or like my review for Bad Boys for Life. You know, love him or hate him, there's a sense of authorship to his work. And when you see movies like, whether it's Get Out or Creed, there's a sense of authorship that you just know that him as a director, he has a command of the narrative. And I love that about this movie. And what I also and what I love about it is the coming off like the Rocky franchise, where we leave our character of Rocky, he's at a point in his life where he's lost Adrian, he's lost Paulie. He almost has just like with, He's lost his son for all intents and purposes. Yeah, he has he has an estranged relationship with his son. Almost like with Liam Neeson's character with the Grey, you almost feel like he's ready to go. And he finds purpose with 
the, basically the, the illegitimate son of his best friend, Apollo. And now it's almost like they both needed each other in this moment. And I love Michael B. Jordan's performance in this. I love how he has the pain, the anger, the trauma of his father not being there and feeling like he has to live in his father's shadow. And the moment at the end of this movie when Rocky's about to stop the fight and he says, I got to prove that I'm not a mistake, that just destroyed me. Because you realize what uh, Adonis was fighting for this whole time. Um, it, it's just, I, man, I, I don't know what more to say about this movie. I absolutely love Creed. When you watch Creed, you see a filmmaker who absolutely loves Rocky movies yeah. and is going to deliver on all the geeky Rocky moments. Yeah. Um, and it it is that, but then it's also its own thing. Yeah. And so... Knowing that Ryan Coogler was going to direct Black Panther after this, mm -hmm. you go, oh, he's going to make a great Black Panther movie. Yeah. Like, if he has as much passion for the characters of Black Panther yeah. and the world of Marvel that, that he does for the world of Rocky, mm -hmm. uh, he's going to just destroy that film. Yeah. Uh, and and, and, and from, from my opinion, he did. Yeah. Um, but, but at the same time, I think Creed is an even better uh, love letter to like to the Rocky films than e even Black Panther is to Black Panther stories. Okay, right? okay. Like to me, it's just it's so in line. It so perfectly replicates the Rocky stories, and then just yes takes it up to it. It just deviates a little bit mm -hmm. to, to be its own thing. Yeah. You're it's, right. It, it feels like, well, this movie has to be in the Rocky box set, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if you buy the Rocky box set and Creed's not in it, then it's not a Rocky not, box set. No, 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 not at all, not at all. So, yeah, man, Creed, that's my favorite movie of the decade. Yeah, um, uh, I, I, I don't know if I was confident that it was going to be your number one when we started, but I knew it was going to be in that top three for it. sure. Yeah, absolutely. So, the moment of truth, man, I have... No idea. Uh, I think you won't be surprised once I say it. Okay. Uh, it's Django Unchained. Ah, like Tarantino's movie. Really? Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, like, this flick for me is, um, it's an angry film. Okay. I mean, there's a lot of rage going into this movie, and, uh, I, I while it, um, while there are moments of anger and, and justifiable rage, it leaves you on like a great triumphant high. And it does. At the end of the day, it's a love story. It, 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 it's, a, it's a person who, who knows that he has to do whatever it takes to be there and help the woman that he loves. Yeah. And um, yeah. he can't stand the world that he lives in. Uh, and he knows that he may not be able to uh, change the, that world, but he can he can do right by him and his lady. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And I think Jamie Foxx is phenomenal uh, in, in this flick. Uh, yeah. The way he starts as uh, this person who has had everything taken away from him and he's at, a, at a, the lowest point that he possibly could yeah. and when he is broken free from that chain gang at the start of the film by King Schultz uh, played by Christoph Waltz and Christoph Waltz treats him like a person mm -hmm. yeah. um, and you know he's allowed to pick whatever outfit he wants and so he chooses that insane blue valet <laughs> uniform uh -huh. uh, and they infiltrate Big Daddy's plantation and that scene where he finally finds the three brothers yeah. whipping that woman, uh, and he goes right up to Little John, and or Big John, uh, and puts a bullet right through his chest. Mm -hmm. And that like that shot where he is standing, you know, oh, yeah. triumphantly in that ridiculous blue valet uniform, and yeah. the camera is low no. angle and. Put dollies up to him. Yeah, and the music swells. And the music swells. 
right before he pulls that little taxi driver pistol. Psh, that's like such a great moment. <laughs> and then you get to Candyland, and it's this horror show. Yeah. And like the way he introduces Mississippi into the film with the overhead shot of the chain gang and the slaves all in those diabolical collars and the words Mississippi and you have descended into hell mm -hmm. and then you meet Satan in the form of uh, Calvin Candy, Calvin Candy yep. and Samuel Jackson like is there a more complicated and ugly performance Man. this decade than no. what S Sam Jackson delivers I mean his, his character I mean you talk about like certain phrases that become part of our vernacular and pop culture like his character has become that in like the pop culture zeitgeist yeah. as, long, as far as like taking that whole idea especially within the black community like that whole idea of like crabs in the barrel um he personifies that and he's so good in the movie though man he's uh, amazing uh, but it like it's all hard to watch yeah like uh, uh, this movie there are like these moments of like beauty and, and humor and like kick-assness mm -hmm. that's a word right kick-assness yeah we can, uh, we can make it one but when they get to Candyland, and it's like, okay, they're close to freeing Brumhilda mm -hmm. von Shaft. They're close to freeing her, uh, rescuing her yeah. uh, from the you know the, the dragon, uh, and how that all relates to like German mythology and you know King Schultz and, like love and all that stuff. Yeah, um, I, I like I, I just I just adore like the mythology of Django Unchained, and when he fails, when when King Schultz fire ha, you know has to kill. Spoilers. Has to kill uh, Calvin Candy. Yeah. And then the world crumbles into gunfire. Mm -hmm. And he is captured once again and is going to the uh, Lindicky oh, mining, mining something. Yeah, yeah, corporation. Yeah. Uh, and then when he frees himself from that by thankfully having that handbill still in his pocket and tricking those three dopes yeah. into letting him go so that they can all go get that money at Candyland. And when the the guy explodes because of, he fires on that dynamite, and then the other slaves who are also going to the Loon Dickey uh, Mining Corporation, when they see Django as, like, this guardian angel, uh -huh. you know, like, or, you know... The, the, they are inspired yeah. by his actions. I love that moment. I, I love that moment. I love that moment. And then the charge back to Candyland, where he's bareback on the horse, mm. and the score's going, the, the songs, that the John, blasting. That John Legend song. John Legend song is so damn good. Yeah. Fire in the background. You know, he's bringing all of, you know, yeah. vengeance with him. And then... You know, he's decked out in Calvin Candy's outfit. Uh huh. Hello, Lisa. Are you guys recording right now? We are recording. Yeah. Fun. <laughs> yeah, it is fun. We're talking about myself? Django and Chain. Oh, that's so fun. Can I make so myself some food? You I'm sure can. Everything. You're allowed to eat. You're allowed to eat. Are you live streaming? We are not live streaming. Not live streaming, but we're recording live to tape. Yes. Live to tape. That's live wonderful. Live to tape. That's I am thing that so we do. excited to be included. Um, but when he finally confronts Sam Jackson and the remaining remnants of Candyland. Yeah. And he's decked out in Calvin's outfit, smoking his cigarette, and he's going to just murder all these dudes. Yeah. And take them off this planet. Uh, it's such a righteous... Like, it feels like God's vengeance. Ah, uh, You know? And yeah. I, I, I love that. And when the house explodes and he turns around and he's that got shot. that Franklin D. Re D. Roosevelt smile on. Yeah. It's just, and you know, Brunhilde's on her horse and she's got this beaming smile and victory. Yeah. Victory in the in, in the face of the worst of humanity. Yeah, yeah. It does leave you with that sense of like You're like goddamn right. Yeah. You know, I, I, I love Django Unchained. Okay. Uh and you know, Tarantino's made a lot of cool movies uh this past decade. Yeah. I I really like Hateful Eight. I really like Once Upon a Time uh in, in, in Hollywood. And and in a lot of ways I think those movies are maybe put together better and are a little more Tidy in their narrative, a little less um, meandering. But okay. I've already, you know, I've already said that I love inherent vice. I love the meander. <laughs> I like, I like the, the the way that Django and Chain slows down and has moments with like that clan sequence, and yeah. you really just get to see these 
jackasses for what they are. Exactly. These pathetic whelps. Yeah. These insecure pieces of garbage. <laughs> um, bickering over their eye holes in their potato sack clan outfits. Like, <laughs> it's, like I love that scene. Like, could the, does the movie need that scene to get, get the point of the rest of the movie across? Maybe not, no. but... Like I like all that stuff. Yeah, I like all same, that stuff. same. I, I love Django. I mean that 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 was one of the movies that was circling around the number ten spot. So you know, on on any given day, maybe it would have been in my top ten. Yeah, and, and I, I rewatched it uh, towards the end of twenty nineteen. Uh, Lisa and I did, and I mean, like like you just feel you just you just go like I wish I wish this. I wish this did happen. Like, like yeah, yeah. I wish that Django did lead to a revolution. Yeah, you know? yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, anyway. that's awesome, man. Top ten, man. Top ten. Oh Decade. my god. Decade. The tens. The tens are over. We're now in the what they call them, the Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties. <laughs> so, Watch like. out for Jimmy Cagney. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, before we end uh, this special episode, let's run down some some films that just didn't make the list. All right. Um, so, I guess I'll I'll go first. You, which one do you want to do? Uh, 20 to 11, 25? I know you're a big 25 I've only, I've guy. I've only got 20. You only got 20? Okay. I, could probably, I could probably just cherry pick uh, some of your films. Like, Creed's not in my honorable mentions, but it should be. Um uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, I'll, I'll do, I'll do, I'll do twenty five. I won't, I won't rank them. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just count them you down. Do you and I'll do what I've got. All right. So <laughs> these are some of my honorable mentions. And if anything stands out, just, just let me know, and I'll try to defend it. If you want to, oh. if you want to call me out. All right. Lock and load. All right. So uh, some of my honorable mentions. I got Jojo Rabbit. I got uh, Captain America: Civil War. Uh, Endgame, Avengers: Endgame. La La Land. All right. <laughs> I mean, I like La La Land. I, just I don't I, love La La. Land. I know, I know. It's just, it, it's like, like you say. Sometimes that movie just feels like a warm blanket. That's good <laughs> for me. No judgment. Um, and then I have Fast Five. Love Fast. <laughs> yeah. Love Fast Five. Ten Years. That was a movie I gave you for yeah. homework. Yeah. That movie just, I don't know. I love that movie. Uh, The Ray Two, Chef. This is a movie that I wish could have been in my top ten, but just couldn't make it. Magic Mike Double XL. I mean, it's a delight. <laughs> I love that movie. Yeah. Um, Black Panther, Fruitvale Station, Mad Max Fury Road, The Raid, and uh, Django Unchained and Inception. Those were the, right. those were the two that were circling that ten spot. Django Unchained and Inception. All right, that's a good. Those are all good honorable mentions. Yeah. Right? Like I think my least favorite of those honorable mentions is probably Ten Years. Yeah, I, yeah. I liked it. I liked yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So honorable mentions. Every MCU movie leading up to Avengers Endgame. Hey, hey, I'm all for uh, it. You know, like just how they pulled all of that off. And uh -huh. What a just like what a uh, like a, a perfect capper like Endgame like that's that, it works. It does. Do I like every little element? Would I have written it exactly the way that they did? Maybe not. But as is, that's a tremendous feat. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna go also with two Nicholas Winding Refn movies, uh, Drive and Only God Forgives. Uh, I adore those films. Still haven't seen Only God Forgives. Again, I don't think it's a Brian movie, yeah. but I, I love it. <laughs> Uh, my second favorite animated film of the year is Rango, of the decade is Rango, Gore Verbinski. Uh, I, I that, that film, close. Yeah. it still looks unlike anything else out there. I, I, you know, we talked about Into the Spider-Verse. I think Rango, Rango might be one of the best looking animated movies. Uh, it's phenomenal. Easily. It's phenomenal. Easily, yeah. Uh, and again, it's not trying to do that Pixar, yeah. House Studios thing that a lot of, like, you know, uh, Illumination's doing and yeah. things like that. Um, my favorite Christopher Nolan film of the decade is Dunkirk. Okay. Um, I, I think Dunkirk is, like, that. that is a big screen feast of a movie. I okay. love Dunkirk. Okay, so uh, Art House-wise, I love Lucky. Uh, that Harry Dean Stanton's yeah. last film, directed by John Carroll Lynch. That was that was great. It's, it's a, it, I cherish that movie. Um, what Matt Reeves did with uh, War for the Planet of the Apes, um, I love that prequel trilogy yeah. I, I, and the mocap technology and what Andy Serkis does with that. It's phenomenal. Taika Waititi, you had Jojo Rabbit. My Taika Waititi film of the decade is still Hunt for the Wilder People. Okay, I love that movie. Um, the Gray, Joe Carnahan. Yeah. 
uh, Slow West uh, from director John McLean. Yeah, every time that movie is in my top 100. Again, great movie, but I, every time I see that movie, I think about you because I remember when that movie came out. Like you, you ain't at least a champion of that movie yep, a lot. I loved, yeah. loved it. Uh, Sicario and Blade Runner 2049. Uh, Denny Villeneuve. I think those movies are just absolutely okay. stunning to look at. I need at. to rewatch 2049. Um, and then Man from Reno. A movie that no one talks about. Okay. Uh, director Dave Boyle saw this at Lost Weekend Three. It is uh, a little crime film, a yeah. little independent crime film about uh, a, 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 per, a, a person who's hit by a, in a hit and run situation. Yeah. No name. What's going on? There's also a, an author doing a book tour. How do these all connect? You need to watch Man from Reno if you haven't. Yeah. And neither of us had mentioned this movie, uh -oh. and by this point. Everyone online is screaming at us, dude. No Mad Max Fury Road. What's yeah, your problem? I know. I had it. Well, I had it in my honorable mentions. I, it's like number fourteen, and again, a great film. But when we're talking about like our personal favorites yeah. of the decade, I, you know, I mean, I, I'm not a disco dork. I can't, you know. I mean, I me. love Mad Max Fury Road. <laughs> I think it's great. It was in my top ten of that year. Yeah. But like, do I love Mad Max Fury Road as much as I like Mission Impossible Rogue Nation <laughs> and Mission Impossible Fallout? No, I don't. Yeah. I'm Brad. <laughs> hey, and that's all you can do, man. Is yeah. be, be Brad. Yeah. Be Brad. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, man, it, it's been a great decade. It's been a great decade. Yeah, looking back, um, some some strong years. I think 2015 and 2018 were probably some really strong years. Um, but overall, man, I think we got some really good films. Honestly, like if you look at the last 30 years, yeah. I think this decade's my favorite. Like I like it more than the aughts and I like it more than the 90s. Okay. Um yeah, it's just, I just I think this was a really phenomenal decade of cinema. Wow, wow. A lot of comic book movies, guys. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of comic book movies. So that is our episode oh, four. Oh, and the Raid. You, you mentioned the Raid films. Yeah. But I, yeah, the Raid movies are my honorable mentions, too. Oh, absolutely. Raid 2 in particular. Okay. Like, it's so not the Raid. But yeah. But the Raid 2... Uh, yeah, it's just there's a lot going on. There's a lot. Oh man, that kitchen fight. Whew. Yeah, I can rewatch that just on repeat. Love it, love it. Um, so yeah, that that does it for this special it mod episode for our top ten movies of the decade. We are definitely looking forward to see what the twenties have in store for us. So yeah, go ahead and check out the podcast um, at it modcast on Twitter. You can find this episode and all of our other episodes on Apple Podcasts and everywhere podcasts can be found and that is going to do it for us yeah. and uh look forward to just watching more movies more movies all right guys so until the next 10 years see you later <laughs>